We've made it to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah is an amazing book in your Bible. 66 chapters that coincide with the 66 books of the Bible. And here in chapter 5, Isaiah is singing a song. And he says in verse 1, Now will I sing a song. No, it says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. So a song to the well-beloved about his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. So the beloved is the Lord. And, you know, just like he calls, the Lord calls the Lord my beloved son when he's getting baptized by John the Baptist. Right here it calls him beloved. I will sing to my well-beloved, the Father, a song of my beloved, the Son, touching his vineyard. Now, who's the vineyard? Well, that's verse 7. You look at verse 7, you see how the Bible interprets itself. You're like, well, who's the vineyard? Well, I'll just keep reading. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And, and that also told you who the beloved is. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts. Well, the beloved is the Lord of hosts. A song of my well-beloved touching his vineyard. So this is a song about the Lord and his vineyard Israel. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He didn't just put them on any hill. He hooked them up with a very fruitful hill. So the house of the Lord, or the the house of Israel is the vineyard, and the Lord hooked them up with a very fruitful place. See Deuteronomy 11, 10 through 15. It wasn't just any place. It was a very fruitful place. Look at Psalm 80, 8 through 16. Psalm 88. Psalm chapter 80 and verse 8 through 16. It says, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou preparest room before it and didst cause it to take deep root and it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it and the bows thereof were like the goodly cedars. She sent out her bows unto the sea and her branches unto the river. Why hast thou then broken down her hedges, so that all they which pass by the way do pluck her? The boar out of the wood doth waste it, and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts, look down from heaven, and behold, and visit this vine, and the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted, and the branch that thou madest strong for thyself. It is burned with fire, it is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. So you see, that's the vineyard that is talking about there. And that's the same vineyard that's talking about here. So the vineyard is Israel. In Isaiah 5, 2, it says, <clears throat> look how he, he hooks them up with such a great place. He finched it. And gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. So he finched it. He put a hedge of protection around it. Just like the Lord's put a hedge of protection around you. He finched it. And he gathered out the stones. You know, when you're going to put something somewhere, you go through and you get the rocks and the stones up out of it. So he went through and he got the, he, he's preparing it. He's getting the rocks and he's getting the stones out of it. And just by searching certain words, you come up with great things in the Bible. It really reveals to you some stuff. Look at Job 41 and verse 30. 
talking about Leviathan, which is a description of the devil in Job 41. Job 41.30 says, Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire. You see that? Sharp stones are under him, and he spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire for you to step on. But the Lord, he went in there, and he not only fenced this very fruitful place, he gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine. He got the choicest vine. Now, the choicest vine would be Judah. Back to verse 7 in Isaiah chapter 5. For the vineyard of the Lord of, the ho of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. But, you think about me and you, and the choicest vine. He planted us with the choicest vine. I'm going to show you who that is. John 15, 1. Look at John 15 and verse 1. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. You see that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ saying that. Jesus Christ is the choicest vine. And we're planted with him. Look at this. You think about that word planted. Romans 6, 5. It says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So Jesus Christ is the choice vine, choicest vine, and we're planted together in the likeness of his death. John 15, 1, Romans 6, 5. So, <clears throat> this is obviously talking about Israel back here in Isaiah chapter 5. But then you look at it deeper, and you can get spiritual application for us too. He planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it. That tower, that's more protection. Look at Psalm 18. You see, the Lord is our tower. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. This is Psalm 18 too. My God, my strength, and whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. The tower is him, and he's in the midst of it. He put himself in the midst of it. And you think about that for us. And you think about Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, or chapter 1 and verse 13, Revelation 1, 1 13. The seven golden candlesticks in Revelation chapter 1, remember, are the seven churches. And look what John sees. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the pipes with a golden girdle. The Lord Jesus Christ is in the midst of the seven candlesticks. He's in the midst of the churches. And the tower here in Isaiah 5 and verse 2 is in the midst of the vineyard. And the tower is obviously the Lord himself. And it says in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 2, And also made a winepress therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. So Judah, though planted by the Lord, had left her place and became a wild vine. He's looking that it should bring forth the grapes, but it, instead it brought forth wild grapes. And you want to make sure that, applying this to you spiritually speaking, when you get saved, you want to make sure that you're growing. And you also want to make sure that you're growing the right way. 
Because even after you're saved, you can get deceived. And you can be growing, but growing the right way. And be let off into some other heresy or some heresy or something. You know, you want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's a whole lot of people that are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They're growing, but they're they're growing into something entirely different than what the Lord would have them grow into. And then you got people who just don't grow at all. But make sure your faith is growing. Look at 2 Thessalonians 1.3. In 2 Thessalonians 1 3, it says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. You want to be growing. You want to be growing in the growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, not ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, you could be you could get saved and you just start studying uh, some good things, but it's not actually the Bible. You're growing, but you're going to grow not the way that the Lord would have you grow. You want to get in the Word, and it'll have you grow up the right way. You want to be what the Lord wants you to be. Here, he looked that it should bring forth grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes in Isaiah 5 and verse 2. So Isaiah 5, 3, look what he says. Back to Isaiah 5, 3. You see, the house of the Lord is, the, the house of Israel is the vineyard. They've been hooked up by the Lord. And he's looking for them to bring forth grapes, but they brought forth wild grapes. And now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem, he says, and men of Judah, Judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. He's looking for judgment. And God is asking them to judge and see if he was fair toward his vineyard. He says, look at it. Look at yourself. Judge betwixt me and my vineyard. Have I done the right thing? <clears throat> Am I the one that's done wrong here? Have I not set you up? Have I not hooked you up? Or are you the one that's done wrong? Are you the one not holding up your end? Who is the one responsible for these wild grapes that have come up? Is it me or is it you? Have I not supplied all your need for you to be for you to have brought forth grapes? Instead of these wild grapes. So he says, judge, I pray you, <clears throat> betwixt me and my vineyard. Betwixt, between, between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard? You know, that's like sometimes you get discouraged with your kids and you've you've tried everything with them. You've, you've tried to raise them up in church and in the Bible and try to teach them when they mess up and reward them when they do good, punish them when they do bad, try to discipline them. You try everything. You try you try spanking them. You try talking sweet to them. You try rewarding them. You try, you know, you try everything, and they still mess up. And you say, what could have been done more for you? What else could I have done? Where did I go wrong, you know? That's what the Lord's saying. What what could have been done more to my vineyard? So you could look at that if you're a parent and take comfort in that. You know, the Lord did everything he could for Israel. He calls Israel his sons and daughters. Is, is the Lord a bad parent? Is the Lord a bad person? You know, you could take comfort in that. Maybe you've done everything you could as a parent. You're trying your hardest and, you know, everybody's looking around at you like, what's wrong with you? You're a horrible parent. Look at how your kids act. Look at your kid. He's out there drinking, smoking. Your son's in jail. Your daughter's a whore on the street. What's wrong with you? Is what they say. But Israel did the same thing. They were a harlot. Israel played the harlot. 
Does that mean the Lord was a bad? No. Judge betwixt me and my vineyard. He said, who's in the wrong here? Verse 4, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? You see, he did everything in it. He finched it. He put it in a fruitful hill. He gathered out the stones. He planted it with the choicest vine. He put a tower in the midst of it and made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. So what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? You know, when you got saved, nothing more could have been done in you than that was done in you. There was so much done in you that you didn't even know about it. So many things happened at salvation. You were justified, sanctified, redeemed, spiritually circumcised. You know, the Lord's done a work in you. And just like he did with Israel, the Lord did all he could to make Israel better. The rest was up to them. He had sent his servants and prophets. In Jeremiah 7, 25 through 26, Jeremiah 7, 25 through 26, it says, Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearken not unto me, nor incline their ear, but harden their neck. They did worse than their fathers. You see, he sent them, his servants, the prophets. He did everything he could for them. What more could I have done? He says, what more could I have done in it? You know what? If you're not living for the Lord, <clears throat> whose fault is it? It's not the Lord's fault. It's your fault. Philippians 2 Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. It says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, a lot of people are going to say that that shows you need to work for your salvation. No, no. Look at the next verse. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. See, God works in you all the things that you need, and now you got to work out those things. You work out what's he, what he's worked in. All the stuff, he's worked in all this goodness in you. Now you work and let all that stuff come out. Now that doesn't mean you're working to get saved or working to stay saved. That just means that when you get saved, it's time to go to work for the Lord. It's your it's your duty. It's your job. It's You're doing it for Him, not to get saved or stay saved, but because you love God. You work out your own salvation. Work out what He's worked in. And what more could He have done in you? Why are you not living for the Lord? Why are you not trying to do something for God? Why is your life not just soaked in the word of God and in the Lord Jesus Christ. You got to work it out. Work out what he's worked in. So in Isaiah 5, 4, he says, What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. So they're not working out what he's worked in. It says in Jeremiah 2.21, Yet I planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? Something went wrong. And it wasn't the Lord's fault. So he says in Isaiah 5.5, 5, look what he says here. He says, and now go to, I will tell you what I'll do to my vineyard. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I will take away the hedge thereof. Remember that fence I put up? I'm going to take away the hedge thereof. And it shall be eaten up. And break down the wall thereof. And it shall be trodden down. 
So he's going to take away the hedge. You see, the Lord is telling them their consequences. They're going to be eaten up, he says. And this actually turns into being very literal. Especially in the tribulation. In Psalm 14, 4, it says, Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and call not upon the Lord? In the tribulation, you're going to have a bunch of people with absolutely no conscience who are going to kill you, to be killing not you, because if you're saved, you're not going to be here. But they're going to be killing the people of God with no conscience. And they're going to literally be eating them. They're going to eat up their, his people as they eat bread. Look at Psalm 27.4. Psalm 27.4. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Well, that was a wrong reference. Let's try Psalm 53 4. Psalm 53 4. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread? They have not called upon God. Let me show you another one. In Micah 3 3, it says, Who also eat the flesh of my people, and flay their skin from off them, and break their bones, and chop them in pieces, as for the pot, and as flesh within the cauldron. You see, <clears throat> a people can get so bad that they turn into cannibals. That's what you're going to be dealing with in the tribulation. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many is going to wax cold. And when people get so bad, they turn into just animals. And they're like cannibals. So he talks about in Isaiah 5, 5, I'll tell you what I'll do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. You don't want the Lord to take away his hedge. That is the only reason. That you're okay right now. Even you. And your life down here on this earth. As a saint. The only reason. That your life isn't just turned upside down. Is because the Lord's got a hedge around you. In Psalm 80 and verse 12. Talking about that vineyard. He says. Why hast thou then broken down her hedges. Hedges. So that all they which pass by the way do pluck her. The boar out of the wood doth waste it, and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. When the hedge is broken down, that wild beast comes in to devour. You know, you get that hedge broken down, who's coming in? The devil's coming in. First Peter five eight, be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. If the Lord takes down the hedge, you won't be no better off than Job. You know, what did the devil say about Job? In Job 1.10, the, uh, the devil said to the Lord, he's like, Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house? And about all that he hath on every side, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. The devil knew and could see that hedge around Job. He couldn't get in there. But when the Lord takes away that hedge, the wild beast can come in there to devour. So you need to be praying that the Lord won't take the hedge off you. Be praying that the Lord will put an extra hedge around you. But with, with Israel here, one of the consequences is I will take away the hedge thereof. He's going to take away the hedges. Look at Ecclesiastes 10.8. In Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 8, it says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge 
a serpent shall bite him. That old serpent's going to come in. You're letting the serpent in. You're letting the roaring lion in. When, when you just, just keep on sinning and doing what you want to, you're just digging through your hedge. And the grass isn't greener on the other side. So he says, I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. The wall, that's a, another picture of protection. It shall be trodden down. Look at Jeremiah 10, 25. Jeremiah 10 and verse 25. It says, Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not upon thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob, and devoured him, and consumed him, and have made his habitation desolate. So they've eaten up Jacob, devoured him, because that hedge was broken down. Look at Luke 21, 24. It says, And they <clears throat> shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive in all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. See, what you're reading in Isaiah 5 is not only a prophecy of something that's already happened that historically, it's also a prophecy of something that's going to happen in the tribulation time period. Look at Lamentation 115. It says, The Lord hath trodden underfoot all my mighty men in the midst of me. Trodden. See that word? Matching Isaiah 5, 5. Trodden underfoot all my mighty men in the midst of me. He hath called an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord hath trodden the virgin, the daughter of Judah, as in a wine press. You see? Isaiah 5, 5. These are the consequences. Isaiah 5, 6. And I will lay it waste. He's going to lay it waste. This vineyard that he put on this fruitful hill. They brought forth wild grapes. Now he's going to lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged. But there shall come up briars and thorns. So he's not going to prune it or dig it. God's no longer going to prune away the dead and useless vines. He's not going to dig it to fertilize it. So what happens? Up's going to come the briars and the thorns. Look at Proverbs 24, 30 through 31. Proverbs 24, 30. It says, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. You see, the Lord wasn't a sluggard. He wasn't a slothful man when it came to the vineyard. He did everything he could to it. But then they still brought forth wild grapes. So he said, okay, I'm going to pretend to be slothful. And my vineyard is going to look like the vineyard of somebody that's just a sluggard that just stays in bed all the time. And it's just going to be covered with thorns and briars. And the beasts are going to come in. He says, I'm going to lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged. But there shall come up briars and thorns. That's exactly what happened. Ezekiel 2.6. In Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse 6, it says, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Them scorpions had come in. 
Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. That's the vineyard, the house of Israel, rebellious, thorns and briars, scorpions in there, lions in there. Isaiah 5, 6, And I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Look who you're dealing with. You're dealing with somebody that can command the clouds. Look at Psalm 78. Psalm 78, 22. It says, Because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation, though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and given them of the corn of heaven. You're dealing with somebody that commands the clouds from above and open the doors of heaven. You're dealing with somebody that can take away your rain, can take away your food supply. That's who you're dealing with here. You're not dealing with just your boss at work. You're not dealing with just some other man here. You're dealing with the God who commands the clouds, that controls the rain. He says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment. You see, the house of Israel is the vineyard. It's been hooked up by the Lord. He's looking for judgment. He finds none, so their head is taken. He's looking for judgment, though. He looked for judgment. But what does he see? But behold, oppression. He's looking for righteousness. But behold, a cry. So he's looking for judgment. Look at Jeremiah 5 1. It says, Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now, and know, and seek in the broad places thereof. If ye can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. He's looking for judgment. He's looking for. Somebody that can look at the sin and wicked stuff going on and make a judgment on it. Even though he's going to be called judgmental by the world, uh, he's so judgmental. Or they'll say, judge not lest you be judged. When that's not even what the verse says, it says, judge not that you be not judged. And it's talking about hypocritical judgment and not just speaking against judging something entirely you have to make judgments and god laid out all the judgments in the bible so when you make judgment calls you're not being judgmental you're just going by god's judgments that he's laid out in the scriptures and like you say homosexuality is a sin you're not being judgmental as in the sense the world's saying it you're just laying it out like god said it is god's already judged it so when you Proclaim what God's judged, then you're making good judgments here. He he even wants you to judge yourself. First Corinthians eleven thirty one. First Corinthians eleven thirty one. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. We should do a daily self judgment, a daily self examination. Look at Philippians 1.10. Or Philippians 1.9. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. He wants you to approve things that are excellent. He wants you to be able to look at a thing and have some discernment and say, that's good, that's bad, that's a sin, that's holy. See, he's looking for judgment. But in his vineyard, there was no judgment. All they were doing was sinning, approving sin, calling evil good and good evil. He looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. He's looking for righteousness, but behold a cry. 
He's not getting what he planted. <clears throat> Just like you, when you got saved, he put the Holy Spirit in you as a down payment. And he worked in you what you need to work out. And every day when you get up, you got to die daily to the flesh and have the fruit of the Spirit. Not bad fruit, but the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. He, give you, he gives you the fruit of the Spirit. These nine things that do, go along with the fruit of the Spirit. That's what you need to be working out. You've been planted with them. You've been planted with the choices fine. Now you need to work out what he's put in.